Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, next generation sequencing, where we're looking at it in the context of the Human Genome Project. Okay, uh, so um, what we have done so far is we have performed a partial restriction digest of our um, chromosomes, and we've got loads of different fragments, basically, which we now want to sequence. We've attached adapter regions on the bottom of these DNA fragments, and we've attached primer regions at the top. The adapter regions are a portion of DNA. They're still a, you know, a bit of DNA, uh, but um, they allow it to attach to this flow cell, which is just basically a glass plate, which allows these adapter regions to bind to it. Okay, right. So now what we need to do is we need to amplify each one of these pieces of DNA, because what we need is we need it to sit on this plate and have loads of identical fragments around it, basically. So, let me sh uh, we're going to um, amplify each one of these via PCR, and we're going to do PCR on the plate, basically, on this flow cell. Right, so I'm just going to remind you of the principles of PCR. Okay, so let's take our fragment here, with its primer region and its adapter region here. Okay, so here are our, here's our fragment, and let me just highlight the different bits up. So here's our primer region at the top here. Okay, and here's our adapter region at the bottom. So we want to copy this. We want to basically go from having one piece to having two of these. So we want to copy it, like so. Okay, and the process that does that is this process known as PCR, standing for the polymerase chain reaction. Okay, so these two str um, double-stranded piece fragments of DNA are now completely and utterly identical to one another and identical to this original piece here. So that's what we need to do. We need to amplify the DNA, and we're going to do it using a process known as the polymerase chain reaction, which I will now describe to you. Polymerase chain reaction. Okay, right. So, let's begin. Let's go over the page and begin. So, the first stage, if you have a piece of DNA which you want to copy, is to um, heat it up so that the two complementary strands that you start off with uh, break apart, basically, so that you break the hydrogen bonds between these two complementary strands. Okay, so in order to break the hydrogen bonds between these two complementary strands, you need to heat this piece of DNA up to around 95 degrees Celsius, which causes the hydrogen bonds between the complementary organic bases to break. Okay, so the two strands of DNA now fall apart. Okay? Right, so here's this, each one of these, and here are the uh, primer regions up here. Now, in order to understand the next step, we need to um, understand a little bit about the structure of DNA, and a little bit about how DNA polymerase enzymes work. Okay, so, um, firstly the structure of DNA then. We need to understand what it means to say that the two complementary strands of DNA are anti-parallel. So, for this, let me draw the structure of DNA in a bit more detail. Okay, so the structure of DNA, it's made up of nucleotides, which have this sort of a structure here. We have the ribose sugar, like so, whoops, um, with this 5' prime carbon coming off here, and off the 5' prime carbon, this is a phosphate group here. Then the first carbon of the ribose um, pentagon um, has attached to it the organic base. So let's say this is the organic base adenine. Okay, now then what you will have is off the free prime carbon here. So this is this, the name for this carbon here is the free prime carbon, and the name for this carbon up here is the five prime carbon. Off the free prime carbon, you have a phosphate group linked to it, and this is the phosphate group on the five prime carbon of the next nucleotide along. Okay, and then again this ribose sugar will have some organic base attached to it here, potentially let's say thymine. Now, let's have a look at the way the um, opposite complementary strand is organized. So at the moment, let's say this 
This is an example of a piece of DNA that I've taken from that strand there. So this is this green bit amplified up and we're looking at its structure in more detail. Okay, right. Now let's look at the complementary strand to it that's here. So you'll have hydrogen bonds connecting it, connecting these organic bases to their um, complementary organic bases. And between adenine and thymine, you have two hydrogen bonds. So here's thymine. And now the orientation of the sugar phosphate backbone is completely in the opposite direction to how it's oriented in this strand here. So the 5' prime carbon now faces downwards, whereas the 5' prime carbon faced upwards. I've drawn the pentagon upside down for a reason, basically, and it's because this strand goes in this direction whilst this one goes in this direction. That's what is meant by them being anti-parallel. They, you know, they're alongside each other, but they're going in opposite directions. Okay, so again, after that, the structure of the DNA is obviously the same. So here is our ribose sugar here. Then again, our 5' prime carbon and a phosphate group coming off up here. And then off here will be the complementary organic base to thymine, which is adenine here. And again, there are two hydrogen bonds between these. So that's what I mean by uh, the DNA strands being anti-parallel. Okay, so they are anti Parallel, like, how do you spell parallel? Parallel. Is that right? Uh, I think so. Anti-parallel. Okay, right. So this blue bit here, this is this portion here, which is next to that green portion. Okay, right. So there's a bit of a revision of the structure of DNA. And obviously, these are just two nucleotides that so would go on and on and on. Uh, right, so that's what I mean by the two strands of DNA being anti-parallel to one another. Okay, and we are going to... Um, w this one on the left is always going to be oriented upwards with the 5' prime carbon pointing upwards. And we might denote that like so. We might put 5' prime here on this end of the strand to denote that the 5' prime carbon will be sticking up here. And we might put 3' prime down here to denote that this way is the 3' prime. Whereas on the other strand, we put 3' prime up here because the 3' prime carbon's here. And then we put 5' prime at the bottom because the 5' prime carbon over here is at the bottom. Okay, so that's what people mean when they write that. That's denoting the anti-parallelism. And it's telling you what orientation this DNA strand is taking. <coughs> Okay, right. Uh, so, um, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, uh, the DNA polymerase enzyme. Basically, DNA polymerase has two properties that we need to understand. The first one is that it cannot make a complementary DNA strand from scratch. All it can do is add nucleotides onto an existing DNA strand. So basically, if I give it this DNA strand, it cannot synthesize the opposite bit to it just from scratch, because it has to add nucleotides onto an already existing DNA strand. And if you don't have an already existing DNA strand, it can't add them on, basically. In addition, something that we need to understand about DNA polymerase is that it adds nucleotides onto the free prime end of the DNA strand. So let's say this was the DNA strand and it wanted to add a nucleotide on, it would add it here. It would not add one onto here, basically. It adds nucleotides onto the free prime end of the existing strand. So, with that in mind, how are we going to get a DNA polymerase enzyme to synthesize the complementary strands to these two. Because you agree, if we could do that, then we've done, basically, we've copied our DNA strand. Um, but uh, how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to have to firstly put um, a, a start, we're going to have to start the strand for our DNA polymerase enzyme. And also, it has to be correctly positioned so that DNA polymerase adding nucleotides on to the free prime end of the strand can then synthesize the rest. So, what we need to do is put a little region here, basically. We need to make a little bit here, and we need to make a little bit here. So we need to start the complementary DNA strand to each of these two original strands for the DNA polymerase. Now, if we think about this strand, 
This strand is effectively the equivalent of this one in green. So this is the 5 prime end of this strand, and this is the 3 prime end of this strand. So any complementary strand to this will be the same as the blue. So this little bit that I've already put on, which is called a primer, so this is called a primer, okay, uh, this will have 5 prime end over here, and free prime end here. So, DNA polymerase can now work and add on nucleotides and form the rest of the strand, basically. So let me colour in that primer a special colour. I'll colour it in orange. Okay. Whoops, that's made that a horrible smudge. Okay. And then the rest of this strand will then be synthesised by DNA polymerase. So I'll colour that in turquoise. Okay, so DNA polymerase will then be able to add nucleotides onto this free prime end and synthesize the rest of that DNA strand. Similarly, up here, if we add this side on, well, if we think about what this original strand, the way it was oriented, it's the equivalent of this blue strand here. So five prime end is down here, three prime end is up here. That means that the five prime end of this primer is up here, and the free prime end is down here. So DNA polymerase will add on nucleotides down here. So that's all working, basically. So if we colour in the primer orange again, try and do it without... Oh, it's made a horrible smudge again. And then the bit that DNA polymerase will synthesise is this turquoise bit. So the primers are there, basically, to provide this initial fragment which the DNA polymerase can then extend, because the DNA polymerase is not capable of synthesizing a complementary strand from scratch. Okay, right, so I've kind of skipped a stage here. So, you split the two strands in half, then what you do is you cool the medium down to 55 degrees Celsius, and at that temperature, the primers, these orange bits, can now stick with the fancy name for which is anneal. They can anneal to their relative strands. So these orange bits are going to attach on to their strands, basically. Okay? Then what you're going to do is you're going to heat it up, basically, now to 68 degrees Celsius. At, why are we going to do 68 degrees Celsius? Because that is the best temperature at which our DNA polymerase works. And the DNA polymerase we are using is a DNA polymerase we got from a bacterium known as Thermo aquaticus. Okay? So it's often known as the Thermo aquaticus polymerase. And uh, that's often abbreviated to TAQ for Thermus aquaticus. So TAQ stands for Thermus aquaticus and then polymerase. So this TAQ polymerase, we got it from a bacterium, Thermus aquaticus, which lives in, um, in um, well, it lives in very, very hot conditions, very, very hot water. And we had to get DNA polymerase from there because if we're going to be heating up this uh, medium to 95 degrees Celsius, any normal DNA polymerase will de be destroyed. It would denature at that temperature. The protein would completely lose its form and lose its structure, okay, and stop functioning. So we needed to get a, a DNA polymerase from some bacteria that was adaptive, basically, to survive, to not denature at this incredible uh, concentrate, uh, incredible temperature, sorry. Okay, so we took this TAQ polymerase from Thermus aquaticus for that reason, because it uh, is incredibly heat stable. And the temperature at which Thermus aquaticus polymerase works best is 68 degrees Celsius. So you heat the um, medium up to 68 degrees Celsius. And what then happens is the Thermus aquaticus polymerase will then synthesize the complementary strands. So you end up then with these two copies of your uh, initial fragment. Uh, perfectly done. Now, you've got two. You've doubled the amount, but that's still not many. So what you will then do is you'll go back through this process. So you'll then heat it up to 95 degrees Celsius again. Um, the prime, You'll then cool it down to 50... Well... You'll heat it up to 95 degrees Celsius. Both of these two complementary strands will now um, 
cleave apart. So in both of these two double-stranded DNAs, they will go through exactly the same process as their original one did. They'll cleave up, the hydrogen bonds will break, and then you'll cool it down to 55 degrees Celsius. Primers will anneal to all four single strands, and then uh, the, you'll heat it up to 68 degrees Celsius, and Firmus aquaticus polymerase will then synthesize complementary strands. You'll continue going through this loop, and the, the machine which continues looping the temperature like that is known as a thermocycler. Okay, so you'll continue going through this thermocycle, and uh, eventually, ev on every cycle, you will double the amount of DNA fragments you have, and in this way, you will um, make many, many copies of this initial DNA fragment in a very short period of time. So basically, you are doing this on your flow cell. Okay, so here's our flow cell, which we were originally working with. And we're doing this polymerase chain reaction on our flow cell. So, what's going to happen is for every single fragment on our flow cell, so let's have this as a fragment on our flow cell here. So, um, here's the adapter region that is bound to the DNA. And here is the primer region here. Okay. And um, basically, what's going to happen very quickly is you're going to continue copying this DNA fragment again and again and again. And you're just going to get huge, great clusters of this DNA fragment at this specific point. Okay? And this won't just happen for this DNA fragment. It will happen for all of the DNA fragments which are bound to this flow cell. So let's say over here we have another DNA fragment. Let's say it's a bigger one than our original one. And again, it's got this adapter region down here, and um, the primer region at the top. And it is also going through this PCR process, this PCR amplification, and it will form a cluster of these fragments as well. Right. And we'll see why it's important that we've got these clusters of these DNA fragments, rather than just one of them in a moment, when, we're, when we actually look at the way in which we're going to sequence these fragments. Okay, so we end up with these clusters, these fragment clusters, all over our um, flow cell, basically. Um, so, everywhere you look on the flow cell, you will have clusters of um, genetically identical DNA fragments, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.